And today's episode is Reclaiming the Temple Mount, The Time Is Now. And our guests are going to tell us all about how we plan to do that. We do have two special guests, the first of which is Rabbi Yehuda Levi. Rabbi Levi studied Talmudic law at Eastern Parkway and then went to Jerusalem where Mir Yeshiva. He then went and got his rabbinic ordination from the Center for Kehillah Development. And he helped found Yeshiva Har Habayit, where he currently serves as Director of Outreach. The problem with today's guests is their credentials, their background, their trained education is so long that if I told you all of their credentials, we wouldn't have time for the show. So I'm just giving a little, little brief on, on where they're from, what they're doing. We've got Dr. Kronfeld with us today, a real underachiever after completing her undergrad studies at George Washington University, got a master's from NYU and her graduate degree in PhD in global affairs from Rutgers. She's an expert in foreign policy, national security. She's widely published in newspapers and periodicals. She's appeared on over, well over a dozen television programs and radio programs. I was counting them. Once I hit a dozen, I figured that's enough. Melissa served in a leadership position on boards of over 40 nonprofits and launched Passion for a Purpose, a social impact and philanthropic development agency with offices in both New York as well as in Israel. So our guests, uh, Melissa and Rabbi Yehuda, have a joint project, which we're going to learn all about tonight, so I'm not going to tell you about it, but it is basically high on the horror. Well, we started off uh, about a, uh, just uh, just under a year ago, I would say, where we started um, recognizing that the work that I was doing along with the yeshiva that I uh, currently am serve as director, Yeshiva Tarabayit, which uh, is a group of dedicated young men who come up every day, you know, twice a day, and we have one goal in mind, which is the goal stated in scripture, which is Ki mitzion tetzetera, from Zion shall the Torah go forth. And that is our ultimate goal. So to that end, we make sure that there are people there that are going in the mornings and again in the afternoons to make sure that they're there for the shacharit and mecha prayer times and to also learn Torah. And, you know, thank God we've seen a tremendous amount of success doing that. We have a you know, dedicated group um, fluctuating anywhere between 30 and 50 people. And um, a lot of the freedoms that Jews have been gaining from their time, you know, on Temple Mount have, has largely been through the efforts of our of Rechim, our young men who come every day because nothing tells the government more that this is a holy site for Jews more than Jews coming and doing their part by going there. Um, so roughly about, as I mentioned just under a year ago, I met Dr. Kronfeld and we realized that there is a need not just within the internal work that we're doing of getting people up there on a regular basis, but also a tremendous need to do outreach to uh, you know, to do outreach, to reach out to people outside of our circles, to reach out and let people know that Temple Mount, the Temple Mount is actually not only the holiest site for Judaism, but is also the, uh, is also as Isaiah writes, it's the house of prayer for all nations. It's a place for everybody to reach out and to come and to feel close to God here. It's a place that God set aside from the start. And I credit Dr. Kronfeld for, for you know, really taking the vision and running with it. She's been incredible in what she's been able to do and the amount of outreach and the amount of celebrities and people that we've been able to reach and to take and to, and to guide. And I'm just going to hand it over to her because she can say it far more, you know, far better than I can. Uh, thank you, Rabbi Levy. I appreciate that. Um, uh, did, yeah, to reiterate what Rabbi Levy said, we did. We met. Um, we actually met uh, just under a year ago on the Har, um, and we became friends. Um, and uh, sometimes, you know, you just uh, know that you can do really good things with people. And we were um, at the same place at the same time, um, spiritually um, and in context of the Har. And um, Rabbi Levy is a brilliant photographer and videographer, and his capacity to capture the har um, really captured my heart. Um, and the way he sees the har through the lens is the way I see it when I'm up there every day. And the experience that he's able to share through his pictures and videos um, was really something that I found amazing. And I was very grateful that the uh, Yeshiva Har Bites community kind of uh, took me in and allowed me, as I joke, to be the 11th, uh, the 11th man in the Minyan um, and adopted me into their community and um, allowed me to stick around and hang out with them, um, slowly adjusting to my presence, but adjusting now nonetheless. Um, and um, 
I really wanted to take what Yeshiva Harabite was doing because it was incredible. They were sharing live streams, pictures, videos, and having this twice, three times daily, actually, Minyan at 7, 9.30, and 1.30. And I wanted to, <coughs> excuse me, and I wanted to be able to make it accessible to an audience that would never look up a yeshiva, that would never stumble across a yeshiva's website, that maybe may not look at Rabbi Levy and think, that's an Instagram I'm going to follow. And I thought, what if we took the whole concept, and I'm just teasing Rabbi Levy, but you know, what if we took the whole concept of yeshiva charabite, and I don't want to you know, make it sexy and Anglo and, and not flashy, but having spent my entire career in the impact space and in advertising and marketing and taking sometimes really tough ideas, whether it's uh, child sexual assault and human trafficking, or anti-Semitism um, and human rights and turning it into something that is attractive for people to follow. Not just maybe initially because they're like, oh, I'm very attracted to that idea, but they become attracted to what they see and then they get sucked into the concept because they realize how valuable and important it is. And so High on the High originally started as simply a social media project where I could take everything Rabbi Levy and the Shiva was doing and anglicize it. Um, and within, really within a month of putting it out there, we just started growing and followers and people started reaching out like, hey, can I come? And they never in a million years um, imagined it would turn into an advocacy platform or um, a tour agency, which now it has uh, with our complimentary tour Sundays through Thursday at 9.30 and 1.30 and additional times if booked in advance. Um, but that's exactly what it turned into. And I think that's really not only a testament to Rabbi Levy's um, incredible capacity to create content, um, but really it is a testament to how important the Temple Mount is. Um, as I often say when we speak to people, the Temple Mount was for centuries the central organizing principle of Jewish life. And when we lost the physical temple, we lost more than just a physical institution where we prayed and sacrificed, but we lost how we identified our community, our personhood, our nationhood, our faith. And I think by being reminded of that, for the first time in a long time, and there are plenty of amazing groups and activists like Rabbi Glick who are very close to doing a lot of good work. But there was something about High on the Har itself that resonated with people. And it was it within you know less than a year, because really the platform only launched during the summer itself. In less than a year, it has caused an awakening in people. And, you know, and, you know, Baruch Hashem, we're not even able to keep up with the amount of requests that we get daily. We do our best. But, um, you know, it's it's just the outburst. And um, I think that's n it's very little to do with, with Rabbi Levy or myself, but has everything to do with the power of the Temple Mount. But I think the most important thing for your listening and watching audience to know is that the Temple Mount is open. It is a place that you can go. If you are concerned about the halakha, if maybe you've had a rabbi tell you that you can't go, um, Unfortunately, I hate to sit here and tell you is that your rabbi is wrong. Um, we absolutely are. We absolutely know where the, I'm sorry, but it's true. We absolutely know where the rock is. And even if we take the most absurd estimates by the best archaeologists and rabbis of where potentially the Beit HaMikdash did, the most obscure ones, we still have a path around the Temple Mount complex that is completely and totally hal halakhically secure. Um, if you are doing it from an archaeological perspective, all the archaeological archaeologists save one are basically in agreement with within a matter of a few inches of exactly where the Beta Mikdash stood. And if we have an unbroken bond from the time of Adam and Eve to today, through the greatest rabbis of all time, who we all hold, that have told us that we can go there, as as I'm sure many of you in the audience are aware, Rabbi Akiva stood so close that he saw a fox emerge from the rubble of the Temple Mount. So whatever you have been told about not being able to go forget that we are able to take you to the temple mount that is the first and most important thing that you should know second we will take you to the temple mount we will take you on that route we will show you the way and we will show you the archaeology the hidden secrets the the current political the stuff that you know that explains the current political climate um 
we will show you the faith that exists there, the magic that people don't know um, is right, uh, right above the Western Wall. You know, Rabbi Levy and I, um, as much as we, we, you know, we have love um, and respect for all our fellow Jews, it's often very painful for us to walk by the Western Wall on our way from down from Harbait or back to the entrance um, to Harbait because we are standing there watching all of these Jews and all of these people in prayer pouring their heart out to what essentially amounts to the basement wall where the plumbing is in a in a construction building. This is it's a beautiful site, but it is a retaining wall um, that held up where the temple once it is not part of the temple. It never was part of the temple. Um, and and for all the spiritual magic and and love that people can feel there, what we are telling you is you are missing out on what on the real real special sauce, and that's going up that wall and going to Haravite. So you can go, it is open, it is safe, your soul won't go poof, you know, you're not going to get, there's no carats, you're going to be fine and we'll take you there. Um, that's most important. Spread the word, spread the word that you can go, send people to our website, highontheheart.com. We are online on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at High in the Heart. Follow, share, we post every single day beautiful pictures and video content. We share our journeys, we create mini documentaries, we create educational content, and we have big plans for the future to begin translating all of the historical and current documents, religious, archaeological, and otherwise about Harabite, so that a broader audience can engage, understand, study, learn, and come to the same final determination that uh, Yeshiva Harabite, Rabbi Levi, and myself has, that you can go to the Temple Mount. We need to go to the Temple Mount. And much like the Holocaust, unfortunately, which this... Um, podcast is aptly named after, it is critical that we bear witness now to the history that we are making. If we are not physically present on the Mount, then the, the Jews of the Mount will be forgotten. If we not normalize our presence on the Temple Mount, then it will not be normal for us to go there and it will be taken from us. Every single day, step by step, we are bending and breaking the rules and proving that passive resistance and civil disobedience just in the same vein as Martin Luther King, is the correct path to achieving Jewish rights, equal access, and eventual sovereignty over the Temple Mount. And I'll give your listening audience one really great example. Um, it's been, because it's been on the internet a lot lately. A lot of people say you can't drink water from the water fountains on Harabite. Well, that was true up until about six months ago, because we started changing that rules. Um, with help from Bayad Danu, with Rabbi Glick, we slowly but surely started pushing towards the water fountains, drinking from the water fountains. And when we were stopped, we would ask the cops, why? Why can't I drink from the water fountains? And they would have to tell us, because you're Jewish. Well, I'm sorry, but I'm pretty sure history has proven the banality and stupidity of that time and time again. And when confronted with the absurdity of the situation of telling a Jewish mother, a Jewish child, a Jewish woman, an old man, an old lady, that they can't get a glass of water on a hot day, Eventually that stopped. And one by one, we started taking over the water fountains. And we've got our eyes on all of them. And we will at some point be drinking from each and every single one, whether or not we are thirsty, because it is not just about the water, but it is about equality. Because for centuries, our synagogue has stood at that spot. And for centuries, we have refused to recognize that rebuilding it is the most fundamental part of the Jewish faith. And the reason why we continue to exist in the situation that we are today with the diaspora all around the world, confronting our enemies, faced with constant war, being led by politicians that are weak and feckless and lie, is because we refuse to recognize that God has said to us, build my house so I may dwell amongst you and give you the life that I have promised you, that I have promised you since the time of your ancestors, live by my covenant, build my house, and I will make things better. Um, I think I'll get off my bima now and pass it over to Rabbi Levi, who maybe can explain a little bit more about uh, the halakha and why it is totally safe to go to the Temple Mount. Wow. Wow, even I'm inspired at this point. I want to go. I think they have opening <laughs> hours tomorrow. Yes. All right. So. <laughs> Amazing. Well, so I'm gonna, just going to take a, a few minutes to go through the basic tenets of the, of the Torah law to, you know, hopefully not cause everybody's eyes to glaze over, but we'll go through this as, as quickly as we possibly can. 
the Torah tells us that there are there are certain level uh, types of impurities that are not allowed into certain areas. So you'll hear rabbis say one is not allowed to go to to the Temple Mount because we don't uh, we're all on the status of uh, of uh, someone who's impure from coming in contact with a dead body, and therefore we are not allowed to go to the Temple Mount, which uh, is uh, is one of the areas that a, one who is impure from coming in contact with a dead body, and whether that has been because you went to a, a funeral or you were you know in, you know ever ever came in contact with, uh, anywhere within. The, the, I'm going to leave the complex uh, halachic reasonings behind it, but basically we all have to assume that we're in that status. What people may erroneously uh, uh, make the claim is that. That is true for the entire Temple Mount. When in fact, the Torah tells us that it's not. It is only the area where the Temple itself stood. Um, that takes up less than 13% of the entire Temple Mount that is uh, that is available today. And therefore, if we can have a starting point where we can map the actual Temple on the Temple Mount, we would now know where the area that is strictly forbidden for someone who is a Tamei Met, someone who is impure from coming in contact with a dead body, um, is not allowed to go. So I will preface and make sure that it's clear um torah law does not allow anybody to go into the area of where the temple stood on the temple mount now it happens to be as as dr Kronfeld mentioned before we have the longest standing tradition in our history from the destruction of temple of the temple till today with a very clear paper trail describing that the location where the temple stood is located inside the building today known as the dome of the rock um be, now that we have the starting point we can now take the rest of the Temple Mount. I'm sorry. We can now map out using the clear, um, the clear uh, <clears throat> lines that are laid out in the Mishnah, uh, Mishnayat Midot, which tells us exactly how large the building of the Temple was. We can even, if we want to be stringent, we could take even a, lar- a longer or a larger uh, size ama, and we could still map it out and be very clear. Uh, to know where one is forbidden to go on the Temple Mount. And that area is only possible on the elevated platform of the, uh, on side of the temple, temple Mount. So the Temple Mount is basically a very large platform. And in the center is a platform that's elevated roughly about you know, 15, 20 feet above the actual level that you're standing. And that uh, on, on that elevated platform is where the Dome of the Rock is standing. So we caution any of the listeners, whether they're, whether they're Jewish or not, if they're co- ever going to visit the Temple Mount, they should they must avoid that elevated platform because there is a serious Torah prohibition for a Jew and for non-Jews to enter into that area um, without becoming purified. And that being said, the rest of the Temple Mount is a lesser standard. And as long as a, a Jew goes to a mikvah, which is a way to purify themselves from the, from the, for that other standard, one is perfectly allowed to go to the Temple Mount. And that is what we do uh, with the yeshiva and by extension with, or I should say, maybe the opposite with high and the higher. I'm not sure which one is the extension of what, which at this point, but what we do is to try to encourage people to learn these halachot, know the areas where they're allowed to go and understand why it's important for them to go because there are five mitzvot, there are five positive commandments one can do right now on going to the Temple Mount. Number one is, seek out God's presence and go there. Very clearly, a Torah mitzvah, a Torah commandment to go to the Temple Mount. And the commentaries explain that that is also so that one would eventually uh, be in position to uh, to build the Temple. The mitzvah is not just to go visit the Temple Mount, but there should be a goal in mind. The goal of one day returning to having a Temple itself. There's another mitzvah, which is um, um, uh, the Talmud tells us just as there's a commandment to keep the uh, keep the shabbat keep the sabbath so too there's a commandment to to respect the temple and that exists also nowadays so when one goes onto the temple mount there are certain rules that one must follow first of all there is a certain dress code as you can imagine you're going to a holy site but more than that one is not allowed to wear leather shoes on the entire temple mount um and one must go there with respect when they walk around um if one goes to the Temple Mount and treats it with respect and treats it as a holy site, they are getting this. They are they are doing this positive commandment of umikdashi tiro. The third uh, mitzvah that one can do, the third positive commandment one can do, is avodah b'amikdash to serve God in the holiest of sites. Um, this is a uh, since the dawn of time, at least according to the way uh, the biblical narrative, this site has been set aside. Um, as the holiest site is a site dedicated for prayer, for repentance, and for service to God. 
um, um, according to um, according to our tradition, this is the site where Adam, the first man, was created. This is the site where Cain and Abel brought their sacrifices and their sacrifice duel. This is the place where Abraham bound Isaac. This is the place where Isaac prayed for children. This is the place where where uh, where Jacob had his dream with the angels going up and down. Um, this is the site where Solomon built the first temple. This is the site where Zerubbabel built the second temple. And this is the site where we will eventually build the third temple. Now, this, as, as the Talmud tells us, this is the site for prayer. Um, when Jacob had his dream, the, the Torah tells us that Jacob woke with a start and he said, is it possible that God is in this place and I didn't realize it? And he proclaimed, how awesome is this place? This is the, this is the house of God and the gateway to heaven. And by doing so, the Talmud teaches us that this is actually tells us that anybody who prays in this specific site in Jerusalem, it is as if they prayed in front of the heavenly throne. This is the gateway to heaven. And the door is always open to your prayer. The Talmud in Smachot tells us that anybody who has any need whatsoever should go to this site and pray, and their, their prayers will be listened to. When Solomon finished the temple, he prayed in front of God, and God gave him a guarantee that this would be the site for all prayer to be accepted for, for, from now on out. So if you want to know what are the reasons to go, the reasons are, number one, to go, as we mentioned, and then there are two additional mitzvot that one can uh, do, which are really mitzvot about all throughout the, the land of Israel, not specific to the Temple Mount, but for sure the holy site in the entire state of Israel, which is the Temple Mount, which is the um, the mitzvah of Lo Techanim Vahashtem et It's really two of the same mitzvah, which is to not allow our enemies to have a foothold in the land, and the positive commandment for a Jew to populate the land and to go there and to set up shop to make sure that this is known as Jewish land. Um, and with that, I will uh, turn it back over to Dr. Kronjo. Um, Rabbi Levy was just blessed with uh, uh, his fourth son, so that's probably who we get to hear in the background, who is aptly named um, after one of the great, great leaders of the Temple Mount, um, Nehemiah. So um, I think uh, one of the most important things that um, Rabbi Levy uh, was thinking about is, is the paper trail. If, if, if the Temple Mount was, was a criminal case, the Jews, the Jews would win. If this was a custody battle, custody would be given to us, right? If this was a case about ownership and jurisdiction, we would be granted the property. The paper trail is very clear. No one disagrees. There may be a few disagreements here and there about an amma here and amma there. Was it was it on this side of the rock? That side of the rock was it? Ten showbreads, twelve showbreads. All of those things are those little things we, we can figure out along the way. But the fact of the matter is, is that the paper trail is unbroken. And if we were to take the Temple Mount to a court of law and treat it as if it was a legal case, the Jews would win. And the most important thing I think that your audience needs to consider is that we have existed for so long without the Temple Mount that in most people's minds, it exists over here. We need to bring the Temple Mount into the present day. It needs to be part of our present and part of our future. We need to stop thinking about the Temple Mount as a place where our ancestors 2,000 years ago wore funny white dresses and killed a lot of animals and start thinking about it as the synagogue that exists in the center of Jerusalem that will function and run like any other school you've ever been to in the entire world where there's just really good barbecue, some awesome incense, and a place where the, you know, the Gentiles can go, the women can go, and the Jews can go to do their prayers. We need to stop imagining that it is impossible. All it is is a building that, and we've got the rule book for exactly how to run it. There's no question on how we build it, how we run it, and what comes next. All we need to do is lay the first foundation stone. And I hope with the upcoming election in Israel and the advent of the religious Zionist party um, and the advancement of incredible politicians like MK Itamar ben Gavir, that we will begin taking those first critical steps to lay that foundation stone because we need to stop being afraid. It is our land, it is our Jerusalem, it is our God. Everyone else believes in him, but he chose us. And we need to take that first step to accept our chosenness and stop rejecting it. Yeah, beautiful. I'd like to add to what Dr. Kronfeld just said and share with your audience that a lot of what common Judaism is today is um, 
is based on this idea that we once had a temple yeah. and we incorporate a ton of our daily practices in remembrance of the temple, but that was never meant to be the be all end all. It was always meant to survive until we will be able to rebuild the temple. And if we're just going to sit here and be happy, sit on our laurels and just be okay with this current state of Judaism, which was always meant to be a second fiddle of sorts, um, while we have the opportunity and we can create the opportunity to rebuild the temple and we just sit and pass on that, what do we be able to say? You know, imagine, uh, you know, someone is supposed to have a certain, a certain, uh, you know, trip and Corona hits and they can't have it. So they have something, you know, in, in lieu of that, let's say they have, you know, a, a small party instead of what they were supposed to have. But if you have the ability to actually have the real deal and you still choose the small party that shows that you don't really want the, uh, the, the real deal. You don't really want the the main thing. So if we're sitting here and saying that we want, uh, that's a great graphic. Just the graphic is a little bit wrong. The, the temple has to be facing the other way. Sorry, that's my ra the rabbi and me. <laughs> um, the actual, if you'd be looking at this view here, you'd actually see the back of the temple, which is so funny that we stand at the western wall. And um, a lot of people don't realize this, but um, the 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 tradition of praying at this western wall is actually only roughly around four to five hundred years old it was only when the ottoman empire came in and sultan Suleiman outlawed the jews from being able to pray on the eastern side where they traditionally prayed they either prayed on the temple mount itself or on the eastern on the mount of olives facing the front of the, of the temple it's only then that we were forced to face the back and and this is what when people pray at the hotel they're actually facing the back of the building but back to what i was saying this idea and I, I hope i hope your your listeners are enjoying this idea if we're we want to move away from this idea <laughs> great trump tower as well we want to uh if we want to move away from being a galut mode judaism a judaism that is based solely in the galut where we're, we're we're just using and incorporating the older ideas that we did when we were in our when we were under subject, uh, the subjugation of other people, if we want to stay in that mode, then it doesn't matter that we have a state. It doesn't matter that we have a country because we're not utilizing the tools that God himself placed into our hands um, in, in 1948 when he placed the, the land of Israel into us and said, I don't want to only keep Shemitah on a Dirabanan level. I want it to be Doraita. I want it to be back to the way the good old days were. I don't, in 19, and in 1967, he said, I don't want there to just be service off the temple. I want there to be a temple itself, and that's our calling, our duty, and we invite everybody to possibly to partake in as best as that possible, uh, best way possible to help us rebuild, uh, recognize the dream of rebuilding the temple, because that's the ultimate goal in Judaism. You know, Rabbi Levy says an interesting thing. He says, you know, if we want to continue living in a world where uh, we are subjugated by others and we are enslaved by others. The unfortunate thing is we are living in a time where the only the only people who are enslaving us is ourselves. We have enslaved ourselves. I grew up in a reform household and I'm, I'm grateful for that because I learned Judaism um, from a very, very like non-aggressive way. And I think that's what made me so interested in being Jewish. But um, we are subjugating ourselves. In, in Reform Judaism, I was taught, we don't have to worry about a third of the mitzvot because the temple is not built. Well, maybe that's precisely the problem. We are not worrying about a third of the mitzvot because we're not rebuilding the temple. To cast aside a third of the commandments that God gave us is like saying, oh, I'll, take, I'll take two thirds God and, and a slice of a pickle. Like, what, no, it doesn't work that way. You either take the whole Torah or you take none of it at all. You don't get to, to pick and choose. I mean, of course, we can live our own lifestyles and we can choose to wear a wig or not wear a wig or wear a dress or wear pants. But what we, can, what we cannot do is choose to ignore a third of the mitzvot simply because the temple is not built. That's the challenge of our generation is that we need to bring those thir the third mitzvot back into our lives. We are the generation we've been waiting for. The footsteps of Mashiach can be heard right now. It is our time, and I know this because Rabbi Levi and I are there every single day, and we are the first generation in thousands of years that has access to the Temple Mount on a daily basis, that is praying on the Temple Mount on a daily basis. We are doing the challah prayer. We have lit candles. We have done Hanukkah. We have done services. Now, of course, this is done 
um, discreetly and it is not done, you know, always um, to the pleasure of the police or for the police to see. But the fact of the matter is, is that, uh, you know, we could we could get started right now. We just put a Ms. A Ms. Bayok up there. We don't even need the full building yet. We could put an altar up there and the temple would be fully functioning. We are this close. What stands between us and the future of the Jewish people and God coming back to reside with us, although I do believe the land is consecrated for all time and he is there in some way, shape or form, at least his eyes and his heart. Um, but the, it is only us we need to remove our own bonds of slavery. We need to demand our politicians stand up to the wall. In what world does a foreign country have right over you know, a square mile of land in the capital of another country? This is not the Soviet Union. This is the state of Israel. This is the land of Israel. This is the nation of Israel. And we need to believe that we are everything that God told us that we are from the time of Abraham to now. And I know that Rav Kahana wouldn't stand for this, this either. Um, and, and he was a firm believer, you know, that we need to be strong and confident. And when we, we don't even, we don't need to take power from others. We just need to be powerful ourselves. The Beit HaMikdash doesn't need to come at the expense of hurting other people or causing pain and suffering to others. But it, what it is now is coming at the expense of our pain and suffering. It needs to end. It needs to stop. And we need to demand our government do something. We need to demand that of ourselves that we take upon these mitzvot. And the only way to do that is to lay that first foundation stone. And I know. We may not see the construction or the, the opening day of the Beit HaMikdash or the first sacrifice or even the, the first time the incense is lit or when they hang the curtain. But I absolutely am 100% fundamentally certain that Rabbi and Levi, I, your listening audience and yourself, Mayor, will live to see the laying of the first foundation stone of the third temple. Baruch Hashem. Wow. Amen. Yep. <laughs> It's it's a it's a sad it's a sad reality. But the uh, people ask me like, what would it take for us to actually have the temple? And the reality is, is that when eighty percent of the state of Israel wants a temple, there will be a temple. When eighty percent of the population of the state of Israel wants sacrifices and offerings on the Temple Mount, that's when that will happen. It can't happen because of a bunch of a small group of people, no matter how pure their intentions are, it can't happen with just their work. We need you. We need your participation. We need your involvement. Without it, we're just a few people doing things and we, have, we run the risk of being written off by the media as a bunch of crazies and a bunch of lunatics who are just trying to incite. I think it's too late for that, Rabbi. But with that said, you know, your audience should know that High on the Heart has zero overhead. What you see, me and Rabbi Levy, we are High on the Heart. We go each and every single day that Jews are permitted on the Temple Mount. We are there leading tours. Your donations, and I'm not soliciting your audience, but your donations to High on the R simply go to us being able to continue to provide complimentary tours and create educational material. We don't have a staff. We don't have an office. The only expenses we have are our website, our email, and, and, and Rabbi Levy isn't buying occasional lunch in between ascensions because it, it can be hot and or cold or rainy up there from time to time. Uh, and, and we sometimes need a coffee to keep warm. But other than that, 100% of the donations that go to this organization simply allow us to get people to the heart. And one of the things that we hope to do um, in the coming years, um, or hopefully year, God willing, if we can find people to support us, is to provide a stipend. We would love to provide a transportation stipend and a free lunch to people who have never been to Harbite. It may not cover your entire transportation cost, but if we could throw 100 shekels at somebody and then take them to lunch and give them an hour-long experience and education on Harbite, imagine the difference that could make. Imagine how many people would be interested in going. Maybe it's for the lunch. Maybe because they know with the 100 shekels that there's going to be some left over if they take the train. Or maybe it's because they're really interested and no one's ever given them the opportunity before. And this will quell this, and this opportunity quells their fears and takes care of whatever minor financial issues that they have. But the, we, we want to use every single penny that we raise exclusively towards this. We're not buying anything. We're not spending anything. We have no salaries. We are both full-time volunteers who work full-time jobs uh, and run companies and other things together. Me and Rabbi Levy have multiple projects together, and we work 
all day long simply so that we could, I should say all night long, uh, so that we can spend all day on the har. You know, every single morning and every single afternoon we are there and then we get up and the har is closed, we go home and we get back to work doing the thousand other things that we need to do so that we can get up the next morning um, and do that. And you know, for your listening audience, I live in Tel Aviv. You know, I travel, I get up and I travel that distance from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem to lead those tours, sometimes leaving my house as early as four or five in the morning to get there for the 7 a.m. ascension um, because it matters that much. And if I can do it every day, and Rabbi Levy with four children <laughs> and multiple jobs and uh, and being my partner oh, uh, in, in every in every project, then you can do it too. Let me ask you a quick question. So All right, Mayor. Let me ask you one quick question. So, what kind of moment who walk? See, are they vacation? They've never. What, so they're getting ready to book a flight. They're going to land in Tel Aviv. So Bevelo, what, they what kind of momentum is there? For? What do they do in order to hook up when they get there and have people show them around, get Let them know. to the Temple Mount? Again, to us who, who go, it's different. But someone who's watching, who's never been there, who's already been, they've been to Spain, they've been to Mexico, you know, they've traveled, mm -hmm. but they've never actually been to Israel. So this is a step-by-step question to do. Tell me, what, up, what is the I'm momentum doing. right now during the month of yeah. Elo leading up to Rosh Hashanah for Jews to go up? Okay, so two questions, two great questions. Um, the first question is, how can people get to uh, get to the har? Well, one, um, if you, um, as Rabbi, as Rabbi Levy said, if you go to Mikveh and you don't wear leather shoes, um, um, and you are familiar with how a harabite works, you can join us every, uh, Sunday through Thursday at nine thirty or one thirty. You can just show up, ask the police for one of us. They know who we are. Don't worry, <laughs> they'll point us out, um, and you can join us. Um, if you would like to book a tour or you're unsure about um, the the process, we have created a fully accessible, easy to read ascension guide that tells you everything from how to prepare uh, in terms of the religion, in terms of the security, in terms of what to bring and what not to bring, and exactly how to get there, including bus routes, where to get thrown off, where to park, and we'll send it to anybody who asks, and it will be available uh, free soon for download on our website. In terms of the month of Elul, um, the, it, it's it's astounding. We are up to since last um, Rosh Hashanah. We are up to over fifty thousand olim on Har Bite. It is amazing. It is the highest number since we've been counting. Who knows? It may even be the highest number since um, the Temple Mount reopened um, uh, um, after the uh, sixty eight war. Um, sixty eight war. Sorry, sixty seven war. Sixty eight war. Sorry, sixty seven war. Right? Sorry, my apologies. It's 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 almost. Who knows? Here. It might actually be uh, since the Beit Hamikdash itself. It may even be, and th that and that tells me everything I need to know about where the Temple Mount is going. People are climbing, people are ready to go, and you may be seeing in the news Hamas is threatening. There's 73 credible reports of terrorism. Guess what? There always is. Okay, there's always a credible threat of terrorism. Every single time Rabbi Levy and I step out onto that platform, it is first and foremost on our minds that we may not step off. It's just that simple. It's just that simple. And that is the risk that we are willing to take. So we have walked through riots. We have been we have been spat at. We've had stones thrown at us. But the most important thing that your listening audience needs to know is that since the Beit since the Beit of since the Temple Mount complex is open since 1967, there has not been one single Jew who has been killed or seriously injured on the Har. Not what? Unfortunately, two Druze police officers were killed. And I know other police officers have been injured, but there has not been one worshiper who Jewish worshiper who has ascended to the Temple Mount complex who has been injured or hurt. And we and me and Rabbi, we've been in some pretty sticky situations and we have come pretty darn close and nothing has happened. And that tells me that the divine presence is not only there, but he walks with each and every one of us that goes in pure of heart and believes the same thing that we believe, maybe not as much or as strongly or as an extreme, but you are safe and sound, not only with us, but because God is there and he'll walk with you. And of course, I'd like to thank publicly the Israeli police for their tremendous amount of work that they do to always ensure our safety and make sure that all those that are visiting there are are protected. And, we, you know, there's no there's no words. How lucky are we that we get to live in a country that is protected by our own? We have a police force and an army that 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 is out to keep the the Jewish people safe, 
and what a dream that my grandparents would have had, you know, had, had access to them, my great grandparents, and we get to be here living almost like the times of David Amelech with the Jewish army. And that is something incredible. So I mean, everything that Dr. Kronfeld said, um, you know, she, she's so much better at it, at describing it than I am. So I, uh, I definitely concur. And, um, you know, that was an amazing, amazing thing. So, um, you know, definitely thank you for the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's a, to live in a world where we are, uh, where a Jew can be arrested for um, carrying a flag, but Hamas and Hezbollah and um, the quote unquote Palestinians um, uh, can bring up their flags and wave them around. How strange it is to live in a world where a Levi can't wear his prayer shawl, um, but the Arabs can bring up their kathia and wrap their feces with it and throw stones. How strange it is to live in a world where we are, be where you know, where holy books are being thrown at us, where prayer beads are being thrown at us, but we can't even bring up a piece of paper with psalms on it. Imagine the hypocrisy of living through that each and every day. And, and Rabbi Levi and I walk yes. through it every single day until they shut us down and i cannot tell you the destruction that they've caused the antiquities uh, um the the burning of the beams the, the cedars the, the the cedar beams up there um the, the the stairs that lead up to the women's courtyard where the same nick nor gates were they are still damaged to this day we still i mean i trip on them probably at least once a week um you know and and you know it doesn't have to be this way Every time I'm up there, I know it doesn't have to be this way, but it requires everybody to stand with us. So whether or not you want to go, stand with us. Whether or not uh, you believe in our cause, um, you can still stand with us because Jewish rights are our human rights. And by not providing equal access to prayer um, and to the Temple Mount complex in terms of where we can and cannot go and which gates we cannot, we can and cannot enter and what we can and cannot bring with us is a fundamental human rights issue. And if I was saying at the International Criminal Court, which thank God I'm not because I'm an American and an Israeli and I don't believe in the International Criminal Court, but if I was <laughs> going to stand the Inter International Criminal Court, I'll tell you what, I would have a damn good case for human rights abuses. Yeah, well, it goes without saying that um that if we refuse as a nation to take care of our holiest of sites, we can't expect our enemies to do the same for it. We can't expect them to treat it with the same respect that we are. If we don't do it, if we don't treat it with respect by, and, and, and I'm not talking about whether it's consciously or not, if we don't go as collectively to the Temple Mount, we can't expect those that, that want our destruction to treat it with respect. And therefore, um, we're just going to repeat the same thing we've been saying all along to your listeners, which is that if you want to make a, a, the single biggest difference that you can make towards the rebuilding of the Beit HaMikdash is by coming there, coming and visiting and recognizing that this is your holy site. It's not my holy site and I'm inviting you in. It's not Dr. Kronfeld's holy site and she's inviting you in. It's your holy site that God gave to you. God gave it to all of the Jews. God gave it to all of the Jewish nation. God gave it to all the nations as a place to pray. It is the way we can connect. And if every one of you, every one of your listeners goes out and makes it a point to visit the Temple Mount, obviously in accordance with Halakha, in accordance with respecting the wishes of God who set up the rules here and recognizing that this is a place that we need, we cannot continue without it. The, that would make all the difference in eventually changing the the patterns of what's going on there and making it much more safer, much more accessible, a place that everybody can pray and a place that people can can openly practice Judaism. And eventually that will lead to the building of the, the temple, the man of the Amen. Amen. We didn't plan that, but <laughs> <laughs> but that's how it works out. Mayor, um, I guess our time is up. So, um, as your as your secondary host tonight, I'm going to throw throw the microphone back to you. And thank you so much. On behalf of myself and Rabbi Levi, the entire community on the Temple Mount, Yeshiva Harbait, our partners at Israel Unwired, Mar Bechai, Passion for a Purpose, Altalina Brands. Um, I hope I'm not missing anybody. Am I missing anybody, Rabbi Levi? Um, on behalf of everyone that we work with. Yeah, I see you should On behalf of all of our guests, all of our future guests, all of our past guests, um, and again, on behalf of Rabbi Levy and myself and Hashem, we, we thank you for having us on tonight. It was a real pleasure and honor. And um, so often we get to have the floor just to ramble and rant and rave on our bima for uh, 30 minutes. But uh, that was great. Thank you very much. When you come back to Israel, we'll do a live stream tour. We'll take you up and we'll live stream it. 
um, and we'll show your audience um, just how gorgeous that site is, how incredible our tour is, um, and how you um, your soul won't go poof and you won't disappear, no matter what your rabbis told us. So, just, the, um, just the opposite. Yeah. You'll, uh, your yeah. soul will be nourished. And to, uh, to, exactly. to build on what Mayor, Mayor just said about Rosh Hashanah, the whole purpose of Rosh Hashanah, as we all know, is to to crown God king and let the whole world know that he is our king and nothing in this world happens without his without his direct involvement and the best most the best place that that can be done is exactly on the temple mound itself because that is God's palace and while the the physical building may not be there we know as as God himself said in my eyes, my heart will always be there on that site. And there's no greater place to reach out and say, Hashem, who who Elohim. Hashem is the is God. He is the king of the world. He's the master of the universe. From his site, from his from his palace, from Harabait. And we invite you all to join us and to experience that yourself because there's no greater way to experience it. Amen.